on Elton Blumel, we speak with Val and Dan, founders of Fostering Dignity. There's times that I'll wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, you know, little Georgie and did I hear him correctly? 4,500 kids pulled a year. 4,500? In Illinois alone. That's way more than I ever would have imagined. 230 plus in McLean County in a year. I'm offering you an opportunity for $5 to know when you put your head on the pillow tonight that there'll be one, one less kid with a garbage bag. I know it's the right thing. Fostering Dignity is a nonprofit that um, was formed about six years ago. And bottom line, when a child is removed from a home for abuse or neglect by a state of Illinois Department of Children and Family Services investigator, that um, scene is typically chaotic and crazy, and that child is asked to put his belongings in a trash in a in a bag in something, and come with that investigator to go to a foster home. Mm -hmm. So we provide backpacks so that investigator has them on hand to replace a garbage bag. Right, right, right. And this this is one of the backpacks here. That's exactly one. Um, it's kind of heavy. It's just got some brochures in it. Oh. <laughs> but it, we give them to them empty okay. for two reasons. The DCFS offices don't have storage, so a case of 24 of those fits, you know, a small in a small closet. Mm -hmm. And um, also, all ages up to um, 18 are pulled, you know, for to go into foster home. Um, unfortunately, so they put their own belongings in mm -hmm. instead of us giving them a teddy bear or our pajamas or anything like that. It's not really a Mickey Mouse event that's going right. on when they leave. Right, right. So it's a, the nondescript backpacks is better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Yeah. You wouldn't want to put Mickey Mouse on a event like that, I don't think. No, and that... Uh, Exactly, it's a it's a rough time. So, how did you two get involved in giving backpacks to kids in this position? You could say that I figured it out about thirty years ago that it was the right thing to do. My background is Department of Children and Family Services. I did investigations for over ten years and um, placed many many children in foster care. So, while that was going on um, for me. I, there was a discount store um, in our area and I would just buy cheap backpacks knowing that that was a better vessel for that child. Also recognizing that I would never know if that made a difference to that kid. Yeah. You know, his, he's losing everything. So a puny little backpack may not have an impact, but it's not a garbage bag. Right. So that's how I got involved or, or interested and then Fifteen years after that career um, ended, finally had the time, resources, and energy. Dan was on board, and my son was willing to do some of the technology part of um, what we needed. And uh, we saw our attorney who said, um, it's a good idea, but it takes um, quite a while to do a 501c3. Mm -hmm and you should partner with Illinois Prairie Community Foundation, which we did. That, um, it's a f fiscally involved organization that umbrellas a lot of nonprofits, gives us credibility and also guidance and um, has been really valuable for us. So when we're speaking in front of a group, we can tell them that Illinois Prairie is involved they know that that's a substantial organization in the community. They know that um, you know we're not pocketing the money, mm -hmm. and um, it gives again. It, it just gives credibility. It's and they've been you know just really wonderful walking walking us through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I read about them in your article here. I have, I have your article that I read in the magazine. Um, Illinois Country Living. 
You know, I still say Illinois in my head. Oh, do you really? <laughs> like, even though I'm oh. from here and we know to say Illinois, like, I've been out of this state for so long and always, yeah. always thinks Illinois. No, no, no. <laughs> They'll know you're a foreigner. <laughs> There's a tourist. Oh, my goodness. But, um, yeah, you talk about the Prairie Foundation, right? Um, mm -hmm. Illinois oh. Prairie Community Foundation. I had never heard of that before. So um, what, was, what was that process like to, to meet them? Was it kind of like going to the bank and knocking on the door and asking for money, or was it different oh. than that? Oh, yeah. We don't ask them for money. They don't, but they just... Uh, basically do the book foundations that are funneled through them and targeted uh, fostering dignity. But the process was to uh, have the, um, the current president of Illinois Prairie come to the house, which was a, basically an interview of sorts to feel us out and uh, do a little back and forth on what our goals were because we were so small and mm -hmm. actually still are relative they have some major philanthropic go funds that they uh, manage there and uh, and sometimes do grants through but anyway we uh, we had that uh, and then they go back and vote whether or not you're an acceptable uh, oh I see uh, candidate for for them and uh, we were chosen to be so that started it out then Val did a lot of work with coming up with the name and the, so. The um, plan and we everything. We really were grassroots. Yeah. We, we didn't have a name. Um, we didn't have a website. Um, but our attorney hooked us up with Illinois Prairie. And to, to join them, you, you have to have a certain amount of funds to become a part of them. And, and they were, they allowed us to have much less. <laughs> So they, they cut us a lot of slack, and uh, they knew how much. I think Myra Gordon knew how much we wanted this to happen, she, and she understood that we just didn't know how. Um, so she, with a lot of patience, she really walked us through um, from the very beginning. What do you think is something from when you were just starting that you didn't know that she helped you understand? You said you didn't ever hear of Illinois Prairie. We hadn't either. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm looking here because I'm going to read what they are. Okay. And <laughs> it's a public charity that among its many services acts as fiscal sponsor for small nonprofits. So that's officially, you know, what they are. And they have a reputation, and, and uh, we, we don't have their figures, but they're, um, they manage a lot of money. They mm -hmm. oversee a lot of money, and uh, they want to make sure that the people they umbrella aren't uh, here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah. So they, they measure, too, your willingness and uh, maybe your commitments and whatever they look for. from. And so we had, we had a very casual but a informative talk with them here at the house, and uh, mm -hmm. we're glad when they responded to, to the green light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question as far as what they helped us with, I didn't even know the right questions to ask. Um, so they gave us a foundation um, from where to start. And I also um, learned later that grants are available through them and we've, we've been very lucky to be granted um, several awards through them, and that's extremely helpful. Then I've come to find out about different resources in our area, mm -hmm. so we share back and forth now. <laughs> you know, I oh, learn good. about this, and they'll say, oh, that might help, you know, this fund or that fund. So it's kind of a give and take. Um, it's become that. Uh, Initially, we didn't know where to start. Um, Myra Gordon hooked us up, hooked me up with um, someone in the Rotary. Mm -hmm. Rotary um, gave us our first grant. I mean, I walked into that Rotary meeting with <laughs> like an index card in my hand. I had no, 
we, we still, we don't have a PowerPoint. We don't have, you know, fancy equipment. Um, we bring, the, we, we didn't even have a sample backpack, nor did we have a brochure at that time. But um, <laughs> they took us under their wing. Um, Joe Michalecki was just so patient and um, he met with us how many times mm -hmm. to fill out the paperwork for the grant and uh, and that was a thousand dollar grant. So we were up and moving. Then, you know, we could order backpacks and we could order brochures and mm -hmm. uh, get things, you know, get things moving. Another organization that uh, was helpful, RSVP, is Retired Senior Volunteer Program through the Y. MCA, YW. YWCA, in town, in Bloomington, and um, they have older volunteers who just volunteer to do a number of things. So we asked them to help us find someone who could design a brochure, mm -hmm. and they did. Uh, they sent us a woman, um, Madonna Courtright, who had run a business in that arena and for um, you know for no charge at all she understood the project um, she put together our brochure mm -hmm. so that's what you learn about you know Bloomington Normal and about just the outreach of and the willingness of people who hear about the project understand it sometimes have a very personal connection with DCFS, which, you know, I, I never ask what what brought you to, to care about, you know, foster kids. Why why did you donate to us? Mm -hmm. Or why what turned you on about this particular nonprofit? Why did you vote for us to get a grant? All those things, you know, those questions will never be asked. But you do um, predict and assume that it might might be something in their past. Mm -hmm. um, even, you know, a neighbor was a foster parent or they adopted or they're... Or they knew somebody who should have been helped. You know, do you ever want to ask people? To, and you just don't because it's out of respect or what? what is the thought process behind that? Well, it could be nosy. <laughs> <laughs> But probably it's more, yeah, it's, it's really it's none of our business if it's not volunteer. So yeah. um, there, there can be a variety and uh, one can almost imagine the variety of situations that somebody would be involved with, you know. And, mm -hmm. and it's the same kind of thing that, that brings people to be part of other nonprofits umbrella under Illinois Prairie. And uh, you meet some great people. So there's a, there's a type of networking that you can go on there and people are so nice and willing to share some of their experience while at the same time you have to recognize that you're competing for the same social dollars out there so okay. it, they don't go too far <laughs> that way. You know? Okay, but, uh, yeah. But as far as, uh, you know, uh, how to have a fundraiser and things like that, that's some of the lessons learned that they had in their growing pains mm -hmm. um, are helpful. So mm -hmm. uh, we find that uh, most people are very willing and to share mm -hmm. their experience and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, that's always a, you know, a valuable asset when you can be in community with like-minded people. Yeah. So and it seems like Bloomington normal is just filled with people like that. I can't tell you how many people that I've talked to around here now that are their main concern is the community, like genuinely caring about the people that live here. There's something really special going uh, on here. I love that you recognize that. I mm -hmm. agree. Servant leadership is huge here. I mean, there are people de that dedicate, you know, 12, 15 hours a day to serving others mm -hmm. um, and we've gotten to know a few of them and uh, talk about admiring you know I I have no aspiration to ever be 
<laughs> ever be in that arena. <laughs> I just I just won't. But there are people that truly just you know morning till night work on their causes and mm -hmm. sing you know sing the praises of their. Oh. And some of that too is fostered even by the the corporations that reside here. Really? They have um, programs that, uh, uh, without naming the company, it's called Good Neighbors Grants. Okay. Where they uh, each employee can target a nonprofit, and uh, it's pretty well assured that that nonprofit will get a five hundred dollar uh, gift. Wow. And those. Um, are fairly frequent and numerous, so that's a good thing. So when corporations get behind the community like they do here, and then of course the two universities too, there's people there that uh, both uh, as part of their curriculum and certain, you know, sociology and other psychology classes and other things that, uh, um, that they encourage students to get involved too. And so uh, when Fostering Dignity looks for ways to raise money. One source is also the fraternities and sororities, to, uh, and sometimes they pitch in. Uh, I know other organizations, uh, uh, Fostering Dignity had a uh, Eagle Scout do his project. The Eagle Scout has to do a project to get their yep. badge, and uh, um, they did, and they had a, a fundraiser at uh, um, Pizza Ranch. Pizza Ranch. <laughs> <laughs> and when people came in, uh, uh, the the young man from Tawanda here that uh, was our guy, uh, his whole troop supported him. And they showed up there in their uniforms and uh, passed out brochures and had that uh, that board and and did things to uh, let the people coming in to know. And they bust the tables and then Pizza Ranch donates the tips. Oh, and so, uh, that's uh, nice. Yeah, and, and I mean, some of those tips turned out to be five hundred dollar checks. So uh, mm -hmm. it was a, a really good night, to, to, and it was good to see young people coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the Yep group. Mm -hmm. you, know, that, you want to talk about that? No, you can. Youth engaged in philanthropy is something that we wouldn't have learned if not for Illinois Prairie. Um, it's a wonderful organization, and it is also a fund of Illinois Prairie, but it involves gathering 20 or 25 youth from the community, teenagers from many different schools, and that group, through a, an anonymous grant several years ago to Illinois Prairie, has an amount of money that they decide what which nonprofits should they should designate it to in the community. So you write a grant and you write what you want and why, mm -hmm. and then they decide. But someone in the community started that with 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 that in mind. I mean, I think that's a genius. Yes. <laughs> So here they give the Illinois Prairie anonymously ten thousand dollars and say, "You find a group of teens. Those teens are learning about nonprofits. Occasionally, mm -hmm. we get a chance to speak and meet those teens, so they're understanding, you know, what goes on in the community beyond, you know, That's baseball." That's like exponential. Yeah. It exponential is exactly growth. that. Yeah. Wow! And now they have become, I believe, self-supporting. So really? I believe they have fundraising events um, themselves, and I don't really know understand that side of YEP, but um, it's continued, and they have a nice um, little chunk of change, I think, um, <laughs> so that they can continue. You know, they're the, they're the future social and uh, sure they, they are. Leaders, they are the. Leaders. I'm trying to think of what I was doing when I was a teenager, and I don't think it was anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> this one either. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but uh, but it's great that they're you know, and it gives us at our age confidence in the generations you know that are yeah. now probably two generations back from us. But uh, 
that there there's some wonderful people out there and they're mm -hmm. uh, lining up to carry on the tradition of giving and supporting mm -hmm. uh, because this is truly uh, I refer to it as Val's uh, nonprofit um, serves that invisible population, right? And that's uh, that's big because there are a lot of uh, organizations that target known, you know, people that have known needs, mm -hmm. but uh, but getting people to think about people they don't think about the invisible. Yeah. I think that when you think about, you know, people in situations such as this, most of the time, people only have what they've seen in movies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see the climactic scene in a movie, and, um, and we forget that that happens in real life, you know? Right. Um, I know that you said you, you just moved here a few years ago, right? Oh, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. okay. So how, I don't know if you, maybe this is a silly question, but I mean, how often is a backpack in that situation necessary, either in this area oh. or in the country? You know, how, oh. how big is the area that you serve and, and how big is the need? Well, it's Illinois and that's by uh, both design and, and uh, realism. And Illinois Prairie, actually only deals with Illinois and uh, okay. other states have their own thing and there are what about 4,500 kids pulled a year. 4,500? In Illinois alone. That's way more than I ever would have imagined. 230 plus in McLean County in a year. Wow. Which is sometimes we don't see that here because our community is so uh, well thought of and well rounded and so there's there are octaves here too of life, you know, like everywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the need is here. Obviously, Cook County has that a lot. Uh, and, uh, but every county has people that go through that uh, suffering and abuse. Mm -hmm. So when we first started even thinking about this, before we had a name, um, our very good friends, Bill and Cheryl Buddy, who live in Normal, they they just wanted to help in any way they could. They helped with fundraising. They supported us. They, um, they were cheerleaders <laughs> from the very beginning. And they Not to are... Not mention their wallets. You know. <laughs> <laughs> they are retired. Mm -hmm. And they are willing to take road trips anywhere to deliver backpacks. And they enjoy doing it. Um, they've had a variety of responses from DCFS offices, some negative, some, some really? very positive. Well, because, I, and I understand that, um, because in the this investigative side of DCFS, you are just blasted with demands and requirements. And even to take 20 minutes for this nice, you know, these nice people to bring these wonderful backpacks for free, delivered to your office. <laughs> you just somehow, sometimes you, you don't have the time to be cordial and gracious. You just say, oh, great, those are backpacks. We'll get them in the closet. Thanks, goodbye. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, and they've come to understand that. But then they occasionally have the, they'll get hugs, they'll get, you know, letters of thanks. Um, so it, it's just, it's such a variety. Mm -hmm. And um, it depends on the office, but the DCFS office, but they, um, they are so willing and uh, they keep, <laughs> they keep track of where, they keep track of when, they, <laughs> they she does a spreadsheet of mm -hmm. you know everywhere that, that they deliver, they would never take anything for um, you know gas mileage or anything like that. Um, so we we're just really grateful uh, that that they're on board and um, such giving. They're just such giving people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and turned out to be good friends. Super good friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that like some people, some people are accepting of the backpacks and some people are like, okay, but we, we have to keep doing our jobs. Do you think that a lot of some investigators might be like hardened to what they have to do and others kind of lean more emotionally into serving? Um, what is that like? That's a good question. That is a good question. And, and it's an individual basis. Mm -hmm. um, in our office, uh, we had every octave of investigator. You know, we had the retired chief, police, chief of police and, um, and we had the bleeding heart social worker and everything in between. Mm -hmm. So survival, um, if, if you want to, you know, continue in that position for more than a month. <laughs> you have to harden to some degree. Sure. That's a requirement, not an option, really. For longevity, isn't it? And um, harden doesn't mean you know, not to take the time to do the right thing. Harden means uh, learning how to expedite the paperwork, learning how to expedite the the requirements for court and the requirements for your for your file, so that you know you've got that extra ten minutes um, with that kid or or with that foster parent when she's having a breakdown, um, or hooking that family up with some services. You gotta keep your eye on the prize, right? The, the child. Mm -hmm. So that's where, um, for me, and other people saw my supervisor differently, but my relationship with my supervisor was, um, you know, the to serve with love. Mm -hmm. That's where I, I was with him. Um, he, he taught me a lot, and he taught me from example. He wasn't perfect, uh, and he didn't, um, you know, claim to be or profess to be. This is Jim, who we dedicated fostering dignity to. So he um, always, always, for, for me, no matter what, it was for the greater good of the child. You make those decisions, and you get out on a limb if you have to, and you make that school principal mad, and you let him cuss you out, and don't you don't you don't care what that neighbor thinks about your decision. You're doing what best what's best for that kid, always. Mm -hmm. And you did. I mean, you know, you did things that people weren't accepting of, and you couldn't please. You know, you weren't there to please anyone. Mm -hmm. You your job was to determine if that kid was at imminent risk of harm, and if he was, your job was to remove him from that environment um, to a safe place. Did you ever feel like you didn't know or was it always very clear what the right decision was? Kristen, there's times, I mean this is a long time ago that I did this job, there's times that I'll wake up middle of the night thinking about you know little Georgie and did I hear him correctly? You know, and then and you start processing that whole case over and over like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. So continually, um, you wondered, did I do did I do the right thing? We had um, I had some, especially one woman that that I that we worked so closely together, and I was so grateful to have you know her to her to bounce off of she. Just a really wise lady, and um, she had done the job for five or six years before I came on board. Um, and we would have many midnight conversations about this is what I heard, this is the way his voice sounded, this is the the way, you know, that that his eyes moved, mm -hmm. this is the body language, these are the words he spoke. What message am I, you know, mm -hmm. what's what's the message I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Um, because it's not always that a kid wants to say, oh yeah, you know, yeah. my mom and or dad or grandpa did this, this or this. You have to um, really look beyond the surface and, uh, you know, ask some pretty horrible questions. And then when, you know, on serious criminal situations, when, 
once you get you know, into the, for us it was the police station um, or the sheriff's department. And once that, you know, once that agency gets involved, it's a whole different feel for that kid. You know, the, the fear and the, um, the distance that they feel from, from their family. Because any, I think anyone who has studied um, children being, you know, removed from a home knows that that's not what that kid wants. They want to stay. They want to stay. They want to. They want. Um, they want to go home. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what that home is like, um, ninety-nine percent of the time. I like the way you explain when you do your talks at some of these, uh, in front of these people, about your list of the five things. Oh, oh, that's so, thanks Dan. <laughs> uh, so. That's why it's nice to have somebody, you know, with you. Yeah. Somebody that's got your back. Yeah, husband. Yes, Very nice. It is nice. We appreciate it. And, and you know, he, he hustles those backpacks off, you know, out of the UPS truck and he hustles them into my car and, you know, we, we move them here and there and he does um, things online, the state of Illinois requirements and when I'm writing a grant, there's parts of it that he's really good at, parts of it that, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's um, definitely a team effort. And mm -hmm. we found what strengths and what weaknesses each other has through all this. So that's a positive. So what he's um, talking about is when, um, when a child's removed from the home, uh, I'll explain this in the way that I learned this. Okay. It, I don't want it to sound like it was my idea. So DCFS was constantly sending you to trainings. One of the trainings, um, I, I just wasn't prepared for this kind of thing because typically the trainings are you sit in a classroom and they feed you, you know, rote information that you'll never remember or it is meaningless. So this particular training was a retired professor and he said, so this is an exercise that you're going to never forget. I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so he said, he turned the lights almost off. And he said, you're going to write down five things. And those five things are going to be your favorite possession, your favorite place to be, your favorite taste, and your favorite person, only one and your favorite smell. And he had us um, think about those things and then he had us cross one off at a time. And that's how a foster kid feels once you've pulled him from everything he knows. And that's an exercise that I share um, consistently with organizations or when I, when I have an opportunity to speak to a group I've, I've had people do that exercise. And then I pass around um, a brown paper garbage bag and tell them to rip up, <laughs> rip up their paper mm -hmm. because nobody's ever gonna see this. Put it in the trash bag. And uh, <laughs> always with the goal of <laughs> get money for donations for backpacks. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's effective and it's moving, and um, and I don't think people forget it because there'll be times I'm at the grocery store and someone will say, you look so familiar. Mm. Oh, I know. <laughs> and then they'll say, you know, you were at my retired teacher's meeting and you talked about those things that a kid loses and, you know, you about made me cry. And I said, I didn't make you cry. It, it brings tears. Oh, she's it addressed does. motorcycle clubs. <laughs> Yeah, and we get the motorcyclers to cry. Yeah. And, and give wonderful donations. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So that's, uh, 
it's it's effective and it's accurate. You know, it's it's not uh, you know it's it's not stretching the truth at all. Mm-hmm. Like that kid goes to you know walking out to my car as an investigator with his stuff in a garbage bag if we don't have a backpack for him. And he's saying, when am I going to see my dog? i got to go to school tomorrow. Hey, hey. Uh. Yeah. Sorry. You know, the, those things will all be worked out, but I can't answer when any of those things are going to come back into your life. Wow. So then a shelter care hearing, though, is held um, within 48 hours, so you're in front of a judge, and then DCFS rep is telling the judge why they felt that child had to be removed. Mm-hmm. what imminent risk um, he was at or she was at, and um, the judge can agree or disagree. And as you can imagine, the judge, I think, always agrees. And uh, ideally, services are put into that home. And I say ideally because um, so many cuts, uh, financial cuts with the state of Illinois. Um, Does it affect DCFS? Oh, big time. And DCFS contracts with other agencies, so if that other agency doesn't have the funding to give, you know, to provide parenting classes or to provide supervised visits, you know, those things um, can be few and far between, which is just unfair. It's unfair that the state of Illinois, I'll go on a tangent here, doesn't spend money for a kid to have a backpack. I was going to ask you, why isn't DCFS providing these themselves? Oh, well, DCFS doesn't have the funds. I mean, that because they're not allocated enough money to even hire enough investigators to do these investigations. Wow. Um, let alone provide backpacks. But uh, we've, our um, Dan's cousin's husband <laughs> wrote for a newspaper in... Uh, Austin, Texas, and when when we started t- we started telling him about this, and he just he got so angry he stood up and he said, "Shame on the state of Illinois <laughs> that those <laughs> kids, other things. That those kids don't have a backpack." <laughs> and, but Illinois doesn't have a corner on that market either. I mean, politically, if it's not in the forefront, and sometimes, which we're not, we have to stay out of the politics, right? Mm. Or we'll, you know. Oh, for the video? Oh, you can talk know. about politics. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, uh, but sometimes uh, the the social programs are the first to get cut, and mm. they're, they're targeted, and, uh, and the open-mindedness would dictate that possibly there are some that could lose a little money and not be mm-hmm. noticed, uh, but others should have more and aren't getting it because... Again, an invisible population isn't popular politically. I see. And those kids don't vote. So what would have to happen in order for DCFS... Like, like, let's imagine that DCFS was going to have these backpacks and every child would always get a backpack now instead of a garbage bag. And what would have to happen to make that possible? Money would have to be funded into an account that purchased backpacks. Just like, you know, we have enough pens and pencils in the office. We have enough <laughs> desks and chairs. Um, so there, there would just have to be money allocated for that. And it really isn't a large sum. Oh. It's, uh, it, uh, it could be done with 25000 a year, which if you look at a state budget in the billions, is not a lot of money mm-hmm. that would give them a some kind of a dignified carrier Mm -hmm. for the little bit that they can take with them, you know. So uh, what it would take would be for uh, some politician maybe to have a connection and introduce and uh, passionately uh, advocate for uh, that type of thing. (laughs) I'm grinning because on each of the cases, not each, we try, the cases of backpacks to go to the DCFS offices (laughs) with a little label and it says, Dear DCFS worker, if you have a rich uncle, <laughs> neighbor, send him my way. <laughs> this is my phone number. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, we we need um we need donations. Yeah. Um. 
So you never know where it'll come from. So far, that hasn't worked, but <laughs> it could. But, but also giving other people the opportunity to uh, help aid a small way to, to get into the giving frame of mind and yeah. uh, thinking along those, I keep using the word invisible population, but things that you normally don't think of, you know. Um, mm -hmm. What, I mean, just one, one dinner a month out less and you could impact quite a few kids mm -hmm. you know so. so really it's an opportunity for people to make a difference rather than like funds for dcfs are probably taken out of tax dollars right yeah. and nobody likes taxes right. i don't think right. but if you have the opportunity to help a kid right. like that feels different so maybe that's what nonprofits are all about right i think you hit it yeah i think that that is correct that yeah bringing like it that. to the attention yeah. yeah, I sometimes say, when I do a presentation, I say, I'm offering you an, an opportunity here. Yeah. I'm offering you an opportunity for $5 to know when you put your head on the pillow tonight that there'll be one, one less kid with a garbage bag. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big, that's a pretty good bargain. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> you went to, was it that market in downtown Normal, the Sugar oh, Creek, was yeah. it? Um, the Corn Fest. The corn in fest. August, right. So how did that go? That was enlightening to me. Um, I had I had this set up. I had our brochures um, sitting all over the place. Yeah, and the we, yeah. Uh -huh. And we drew attention. We had sample backpacks. And, you know, I mean, I just kind of stood out there when someone would glance at the poster, I'd say, let me tell you about what we do and why. I'd give them the 30-second, and if they wanted more, you know, I mean, obviously I can talk a long time about it, um, but the stories would just flow. One young guy, maybe 25, he, um, he said, yeah, I was one of those kids, I was 12. I, I said, you know what, you know what DCFS did to me? I said, well, he's obviously, you know, still, even though he was at risk of harm and he needed to get removed from that, he's still just very, very bitter that that experience happened to him. It happened to me, you know, mm -hmm. not someone abused me, so I needed help. It happened to me, and but he said he re, he said, not only did they, you know, make me put my stuff in a garbage bag, but they brought me to this office with these like tables spread out with these used clothes and told me to pick some. Uh -huh. and, and, that was, and that was when he was 12. You know, he's a 25 year old professional guy. Um, never, never left him, you know, that never left him. Uh, but people would talk about how their parent, you know, oh, my mom and dad were foster parents and I remember those kids coming uh, with, with garbage bags. When, when this article that you mentioned um, first came out, we heard, we asked that donations went to Illinois Prairie. That's how, you know, part, part of how that agency works and that's the right thing to do. But um, I, I try to follow up each donation with a personal thank you. And a, a gentleman from Eureka gave a very generous donation and I wrote him a thank you. And we got a letter back from him and it said, um, I don't have permission to you know, mention sure. his name or anything, but um, he was involved in the court system and, uh, and he said, you know, it was 25 years ago, but I remember a family of four little kids aged three to 10 coming, um, he said, into my courtroom, each carrying a brown paper bag with their belongings in it. And that prompted him to give a donation. And he said, I wish that your agency would have been around then. Mm -hmm. uh, and so do I. <laughs> um, so the, the event um, at the Corn Fest, different reactions from different people, the opportunity to, you know, to just say thank you and let them write back and say this is what 
this is why, mm -hmm. why it was important to me, and have you know to have that connection um, is therapeutic. It's yeah. therapeutic for me, um, and also I think um, you know gives people a purpose. And at the Corn Fest, even if they didn't make a donation, it was you know somehow freeing. Um, for for many that day to be able to say mm -hmm, that you know that happened to me, and even if the awareness doesn't directly benefit fostering dignity, there's benefit to those people to get them thinking along a certain line. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I remember one of the, your first uh, uh, projects at the church in Manier. Oh yeah, when the, when the I don't know what you call it, the young people's study group, you know, that they do there. And they took on the project of collecting money in backpacks. So it gave them a chance to learn how to do something and give that could make a difference. And mm -hmm. Val got up in front of the congregation and, and did her spiel. You know, <laughs> the Tears running down my eyes. <laughs> 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 that was a tough one. They're all tough. Oh, my they gosh. Come up and shook your hand after. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he had a hundred dollar bill. Huh? No. Yeah. And you never ask why. Yeah. You know, you know. Yeah. That was a fluke. And this is so wonderful in this community. So I called the 4-H office trying to get, you know, 4-H age um, youth involved in doing a fundraiser to raise money for backpacks, which has, you know, has worked. But, um, the woman who answered the phone, she said, well, everyone's in a meeting, but I'm just watching the phones. I'm a leader. I live in Manier. She said, but tell me about your project anyway. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'll have, I'll have, you know, the person that needs to, you need to talk to call you tomorrow, but tell me about it. So she ended up being a big part of this church and she got us in front of that youth group and in front of that congregation. And uh, a beautiful, <laughs> you know, just a beautiful connection. Yeah, and a great a fluke. experience for us too. Wow. Yep. Maybe a fluke. All oh, right. Maybe, maybe, maybe All not. right. <laughs> we had a, uh, is it a year ago? Uh, it was time for a new central air conditioner. Oh. So the guy came to the house that owned a local company, mm -hmm. uh, and sat down, and he wasn't getting out without. The brochure. <laughs> and, By the uh, way, Chris. Uh, uh, but he he came out for that, and it turned out uh, he sent a check for five hundred bucks. So you know, I said, wow. he said, "Come see me next year." Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of thing. There's there's people out there, but they don't know. So when you can happen upon them or otherwise, maybe something like this will help get some word out. You know, and that's what would be a good result, right, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, both educate people and inform them. Well, when you told me about this article and how many times it took you to get oh, it in the magazine. Yeah. 14. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's okay. I mean, that's, we're kind of used to that. You get thick-skinned um, when you're told, oh, maybe next month, or, well, we don't have any room on our agenda for you this time, or... You know, oh, maybe you could call and talk to someone else. Um, I mean, I go to churches sometimes three and four, five times the same church, thinking the next secretary at that desk is really going to get it to the right person. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that, that works. And there's a lot of people banging on doors. So, I mean, you know, you have to understand that we are competing okay. for a limited you know, amount. it's not that they they don't care and don't want to. It's just that there are so many that every once in a while, you know, an acorn drops your way. Okay. <laughs> so try not to take it personally. Oh, is what oh, you're saying. Oh, don't no, no. Yeah. You can't do that. And, uh, and when you're retired, it's supposed to be six Saturdays and a Sunday, but we uh, <laughs> we have a lot of interests, and so we uh, uh, like to stay busy and do things so yeah but that's that's one that Val's really worked hard at yeah but it's um, um, like I said to somebody the other day it's like you know DCFS was the meat and potatoes of those years but this is the dessert mm -hmm. to be able to do this 
it's just, um, I know it's the right thing. Yeah. I've never questioned it for a second. So you started in 2013? Right. And was it full scale right away? Or? Oh no, it was baby steps, totally. It was learning um, and it was getting, getting credibility. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like we've made some strides. And some legalities. I mean, if, uh, well, if someone's delivering your backpacks and they hit a tree, I mean, so you have to incorporate right. to shelter. Uh, and uh, plus, when an organization is picked up by Elmer Prairie, they have to incorporate so that their insurance and, you know, things like that. And so mm -hmm. with that comes the annual reports to the Attorney General and things like that. Mm. So that there's like that a lot of work. side that's not... Not, it's not a lot of work, but it, there, every nonprofit has to do an annual, uh, some paperwork uh, too. But then there's the corporation side where you have to have your articles of incorporation, your board of directors, and even though you're piddly, basically, mm -hmm. uh, it's a requirement. You just have to. So you know, sometimes uh, you have to realize that the juices worth the squeeze, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's how, again, just focus on yeah. the end. Fourteen mm -hmm. squeeze is no problem. <laughs> you know? I don't know if you get the juice, eh? <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah. Let's see. So, it's 2019. Mm -hmm. You've come a long way since 2013. What's, what does the next five years look like for you? Oh, I love that question. Yeah. Um, it's pretty easy. <laughs> more donations, more backpacks. Mm -hmm. Less children with garbage bags. Mm -hmm. And enough to supply every DCF office, office in Illinois, which I don't know how many there are. Do you? Oh, it offices? depends. There's field offices and... Oh. Um, but again, 5,000. Enough to get 5,000 a year distributed. Mm -hmm. is, And then maybe, who knows, then you can add on a different you know, target for the nonprofit. Fourteen hundred last year. That's what you delivered. That's what we delivered. Well, Cheryl and Bill, buddy, delivered. delivered. Okay. Um, Fourteen hundred. My son delivers um, some in the Chicago area for us, uh, which is helpful. Now, is drop shipping not an option? Oh, well, we like to not spend money on anything but backpacks. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's why you have that's friends deliver them and they don't charge you for correct. it. Correct. And uh, nobody takes a penny. There's no cost for postage and whatever, brochures. Or whatever. It just, everything goes towards the backpacks. Gotcha. So to say what's in, the fi in five years, if it were a perfect world, I would love to walk any other nonprofit to be formed and to be successful anywhere in the United States. I mean, I get it, Illinois. We need to serve Illinois first. But if someone called me from Virginia and thought and said, I think I should start something like this, um, would I would do them. everything I could, you know, for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Because I had so much help, um, you know, from others, not who knew about giving out backpacks, but nonprofits in general. Um, someone else, one time somebody said, I think there's another agency collecting backpacks in Bloomington, Val, for foster kids. And I said, well, I hope so. <laughs> because, you know, that's great. And of course, there's backpacks for school. And there's yeah. so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what it is. Sometimes people confuse fostering dignity with the back-to-school oh. projects, which mm -hmm. are wonderful in this town. Sure. That's um, when you stuff the backpack with supplies? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these backpacks are empty. Right. That might, I feel like that might make it more difficult for you to get um, people involved. Because, I mean, you have an event and you bring people and they bring the backpacks and then they actively stuff it. You know, you're giving That's them right. the physical activity. 
But doesn't it sound Plus, like you have one? Then they often get to be a part of handing them out. Yeah. So, and, and all I tell people is, just give me money so I can buy backpacks and give them to kids we'll never see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's the bottom line. Yeah. Um, so you're right. Uh, it's a different frame of mind, the giver, mm -hmm. um, you know, who wants to be involved in the back to school compared to fostering dignity. It's, it is, it's a different frame of mind. Not that someone can't do both, but um, we're very hands off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't get the warm, fuzzy, yeah. you know, hug from the kid you ever. Have to, you have to volunteer in other arenas to, <laughs> to get to, which... Maybe being a foster parent or... Right. Or, yeah, or just any other, through this retired senior volunteer program that you can go to, and we have went to a variety of... Uh, uh, some schools will have, let's just say they have a Thanksgiving dinner, but the, the kids there don't have a parent that will come. There's a lot of situations out there. Oh. And so you're the pseudo parent and you go and sit with the kid. And so there's ways you can get the, the warm feelings of the seeing the people and seeing them smile. But, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with people wanting that. But in the case of fostering dignity, you have to be okay with being anonymous. Now, do the kids that receive the backpacks, not that this is the priority at the time, but do they, know or do they find out that the backpack was donated to someone or from someone no i doubt it it's so not important in that child's life at that point yeah. yeah it's just that you know you hope that maybe when they wake up that next morning at a stranger's house that they that they're go, unzipping a backpack they have to go to a new school they don't have to you know they get something to, i don't know just something you know? yeah, yeah there's no like note in the backpack that says donated by that's that's not important to us no. knowing what you know what that kid's I think endured it's important not to do that it is important I not to too. that's yeah. interesting why why do you think that well i think that because uh, uh it puts the focus in the wrong direction maybe it's just that it's there you know yeah um, and at some point that maybe People will rationalize through it that it had to be there as a result of someone, but mm -hmm. uh, but who and you know and all that logistics isn't so important. Mm -hmm. I'll bring this up. You have children. Yeah. You shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have Xavier is six and Hyatt is three. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So picture, go home this afternoon, and there's a knock on your door. And you learn the worst thing that you can imagine in your life has gone on in your home. And for that reason, your children are not considered safe. Mm -hmm. And for even if it's for 48 hours, a stranger, an investigator, takes them, you know, with her. And you're standing at your door <laughs> and your kids are being taken by the state of Illinois. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Unimaginable, right? I mean, it's, it's imaginable. imaginable. It's an unimaginable that those people would survive. I mean, right. like, right. it's that instinctual, I mean, how did you, how did you survive? Well, with, because you go with a police officer every time to every visit. No. No? I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a dangerous, <laughs> no. that's a dangerous no. situation no. that you're entering into, but you must weigh and say, well, it's right. more dangerous for the child, right? Right. So you, every, when, you, when you get in 24-7, anybody can call the hotline 365 days a year. So the hotline gets a report, and if they feel that it warrants investigation, they forward it to the field office that covers that area. And an investigator within 24 hours goes to that home or that school to see the victim, the alleged victim. Mm -hmm. And if, um, if the opportunity is there, prior to interviewing that, that child, 
they do some collateral contacts. If the child's in school, they might ask the teacher some questions, or if, they, if the reporter is not anonymous, they can ask the reporter, well, the details of what they're reporting. And granted, many, many um, reports are unfounded, meaning there is no abuse or neglect evident. Uh, neighbors fight, in-laws fight, <laughs> exes fight. Mm -hmm. You know, people allege, um, things all the time uh, but if you get into that home and you are you did not anticipate taking that child you you leaving to get law enforcement you're risking yeah that child being you know further harmed and now, obviously, I didn't have cell, we didn't have cell phones, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh -huh. um, so there were times you took that child right there and then. And it was crazy how that worked. Mm -hmm. It was crazy that you didn't get a ball bat on your head on the way out the door. Right. Because here's a parent or two parents and you're saying, here's my credentials. You know, you have the, the DCFS identification and all that kind of thing. Um, but you're telling them, I'm taking your, your kid with me now. Wow. And, uh, and they may not be educated enough to say, I'm calling my lawyer. And even if they are calling their lawyer, you can call whoever you want. I'm taking your child now. And, um, you know, we'll be in court within 48 hours. And ideally, um, you know, you... You could anticipate going into a house and anticipate that law enforcement would be useful mm -hmm. and, um, and available. But, um, you know, there were plenty of times when, when I thought, I don't want to walk out this door facing my car. I want to be looking, you know, behind me. Mm -hmm. I want that kid, in, you, <laughs> you just planned it. You know, you knew that that kid or kids was ahead of you. And as you walked out that door, you know, you watched for things to happen, and you were, you know, you you felt um, vulnerable. You mm -hmm. were vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, it's a wonder that uh, that more DCFS workers weren't, you know, physically harmed or just ended up in someone's basement. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, absolutely. You, you put yourself, you know, but that that's. Really, you know, you're not thinking of your safety um, as much as you're thinking of the safety of those kids because they're innocent youth, mm -hmm. you know, and you're an adult. Mm -hmm. Still, you know, like I said, nightmares once in a while of did I do the right thing? Did I make the right call? Because it goes both ways. Maybe I shouldn't have taken that kid out of that home. Maybe that, maybe that didn't warrant maybe there was another way you know the last thing you want to do is um, is remove that child mm -hmm. um, man I have I have one memory and I'm imagining that you have hundreds that you have to think of like I, I used to live in an apartment building in um, Oklahoma and I was probably about seven years old and the people that lived below us uh, there was a couple times, I mean, I would watch the probably three-year-old boy and we would go walk around and sometimes we'd come back and, you know, every once in a while he had an accident. He was potty training, but one day his oh, no. dad came outside and he said, you did that again, you know, and the oh, three-year-old hides behind me. And um, I didn't, I, I, I was kind of oblivious to what exactly was happening. A couple weeks later, uh, my parents were not in the apartment, and there was a lot of, you know, abusive sounds coming through the floorboards. And um, me and my sister, were, I remember pounding on the living room floor, you know, yelling, stop oh, it, no. stop it, stop it. But, like, as a child, it doesn't occur to you what exactly is happening and that that shouldn't be. Like, you know, you don't hit people, but... The, the idea was almost inconceivable that an adult would be doing this to a child. Like, I don't think I ever even mentioned it to my parents. It was that, like, 
disconnected from my reality. But wow. he was picked up by the police in a separate incident. Um, and when he was removed from the apartment, you know, the landlord went in there and discovered the, oh, no. the things that shouldn't have been, the, the lock on the closet door oh, that twists with your hand oh, that no. was facing outside the door. You know, things like that. Like, obviously, this child was in a situation he should have been removed. Oh, like, I wonder about that kid all the time. Oh. Like, I wonder what he's doing now in his life. 23 like, years later. 23 years later. Like, Boy. And having a career won't, of it, that. It won't, it won't leave you. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, um, did you know, yeah. did you know that you would live with that when you, when you took your job as an investigator? Do you ever wish that you hadn't? No. Oh, <gasps> no. I don't wish that I hadn't. I'm glad it's over. Yeah. Um, I would, um, I would choose not to go back to that career. I admire people who do it well. Mm -hmm. um, you don't forget. But you know, everyone has memories that alarm them from when they were young, some when they were, you know, their, their own household. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of who we are. It's part of how we grow and uh, thrive. And it's, um, it's how we become, you know, what we are and our priorities. Not in, re in spite of it, but in response to it. So you can, um, you know, you can think all day long about the should, should have, you know, should have done this, I shouldn't have done that. And, uh, or you can, <laughs> there's a saying it says, I looked around and said, somebody should do something about this. And then I realized I am somebody. So you can put your energy towards something positive and, um, you know, move forward in, in that direction. Yeah. You got support from your family. It feels, you know, it's, Yeah. It's yeah. rewarding, you know, at, at this stage. I said it's the dessert. <laughs> the yeah. dessert. <laughs> Some mixed emotions, I'm sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, let's just exhale for a minute. <laughs> uh, Good idea. Uh, let's have a drink. <laughs> yeah. So, Val and Dan, thank you so much for being on the show today. We talked about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, there were some big emotions stirred. Um, and, Personally, I can't speak for everyone, there but Kristen. <laughs> I mean, what you're doing is just so important. Aww. You know, that these children realize that they're, they're important. You know, they're, the things that they love are important, and they're not throwing them in garbage bags. Yeah. You know, just that small gesture can mean the world to a kid. Thank um, you. And hence the name Fostering Dignity. Mm -hmm. A verb and a noun. <laughs> You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and fostering oh, also with foster it. care oh. that kind of goes together to make it more memorable, too. I think so. Was that intentional? Oh, we had a, a hundred different possible names <laughs> at one point. <laughs> it really did. And uh, that was a two in the morning, you know, like, hmm. Hmm. And then, you, you know, you think about the next day and you let it sit a while and you uh -huh. and that. It's kind of like naming a baby. <laughs> it is. It's exact. It's a when lot that like baby's that. born, you better have it's, a name. Yeah, it's yeah. forever. <laughs> nice. That's right. You can't change your mind every week. Yeah. <laughs> so you go, you go around and you share this message with people in, in different events, right? If, if somebody is listening right now and they want to invite you to speak at their organization or their event, how can they get in touch with you? Well, one, they can call the home phone which is 309-728-2696. Um, and they can uh, request 
uh, Val contact them and set up a time to come and do that. Also through uh, www.fosteringdignity.org, there's a contact us page there. And through Illinois Prairie and referencing Fostering Dignity, and that's where donations go to, as the website explains. So they can on the website they have PayPal and other ways to, uh, you know, Visa and all that. But uh, uh, it goes to Fostering Dignity and it's denoted to Fostering Dignity, so they know where to what fund to put the uh, donation in. That's important to us. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, they uh, it goes into more or less a general fund and. But if uh, so, um, uh, the donations are tax deductible, and Illinois Prairie sends out a receipt for that. So people should know that you know their giving does have a practical side to it as well. And uh, um, but basically, uh, uh, that's it. And uh, um, there's, I don't think the email is in here, but uh, but either through that phone number, we can uh, give them personal emails, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they can uh, contact us that way. And it kind of depends on the angle of their questions, where we go from there, you know. But, uh, mm -hmm. but everybody would get a response and a, you know, a chance to ask whatever questions. And if we can just educate somebody, that's fine too. You know that old saying, two but, goals in life that we must reach, one's to learn, the other teach. <laughs> you know, so if you can help somebody, which is an old Chinese proverb. But, uh, uh, so 309-728-2696 is our home phone number. Okay. Not textable. Be glad to um, send brochures. Um, and again, you know, set up any speaking opportunities. To, um, anything, any ideas people have to spread the word. After. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Kristen. And thank you for what you're doing. Enjoy, enjoyable. Thank you.